All rise. The lawyer of the apes is now in session. Good morning, guys. How's it going? Welcome to episode five of Lawyer of the Apes. Yesterday, I talked about the short squeeze antitrust motion to dismiss. The video ran a little long, so I didn't want to keep going and discuss the opposition in that video. So today, we're going to discuss the opposition to the motion to dismiss. So consider this part two to yesterday's video. If you didn't listen to yesterday's video, definitely listen to it. It's really eye-opening to see the arguments that are being made in the motion to dismiss. Essentially, the defendants are saying, listen, our backs were against the wall. We had no choice uh, to do what we did. Uh, so you guys really have no plausible argument that we conspired together. It's really a very specious argument. And if you read it in very closely, you can see that it's very hollow. And I really don't think it has much in the way of the possibility of success. However, again, you know, every judge is different and you never know what you're going to get. So I can't ever predict what's going to happen. But let's take a look at the opposition papers and see what the attorneys for the plaintiffs said in retort to some of the contentions set forth in the motion to dismiss. So again, the format for the motion and the opposition papers is very similar to the format for the motion to dismiss. You have the heading caption, you have, it says that it's defendant's opposition to the motion, to, plaintiff's opposition to defendant's motion to dismiss the complaint. Again, you have the table of contents where they set forth a list of what they're going to discuss. Then the table of authorities, which is all the cases they're gonna rely upon, which are substantial. And then of course the rules and other authorities that they're gonna be citing to. Okay, so here we go, let's get started. Plaintiffs corrected consolidated class action complaint plausibly, and remember plausibly, that's an important word because remember what we learned from Twombly in the last video, they have to plausibly allege that there was a conspiracy. The standard was increased after the Twombly case. Plaintiffs corrected consolidated class action complaint plausibly alleges that defendant entered an agreement on or about January 27, 2021 to restrict retail investors from purchasing the relevant securities in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act, 15 U.S.C. Section 1. So yesterday we went over uh, the Sherman Act and what that was and what the elements are. Plaintiffs say they allege who, the who, what, when, where of the agreement. It explains how the financial services market is extraordinarily susceptible to collusion, how defendants have the motive and opportunity to enter into the anti-competitive agreement and how they monitor and enforce their agreement. So here they're saying, listen, this market is just the way it's designed, the way it's set up, the way things are not enforced by the SEC. It just is inherently susceptible to collusion. As plaintiffs allege, defendants simultaneously impose restrictions on their stock trading platforms, leaving retail investors with no option but to sell or hold the relevant securities. You know, I, that still gets me to this day. Remember, they left it where the only thing that retail was allowed to do was sell or hold. Let's assume for argument's sake, as the stock was do as going down, you know, maybe you wanted a dollar cost average down on the way. Think about how much money people lost just by not being able to DCA, let alone the fact that it totally uh, screwed up the trajectory of the stock in an upward motion. It didn't allow anyone to buy the stock on the way down to average down. So then by the time they did turn it back on, it goes up a little bit and then your ability to average down was not as great as it could have been. That's also, that is, there's, no, there's more to the argument that than just losing money and, and selling at a high number. The concern here is also the fact that there was opportunities to average down and that was taken away as well. The defendants did not so to suppress the price of the relevant securities and enable defendants that those securities to offload its highly speculative short positions. Such direct evidence establishes a per se violation. So remember, a per se violation, in order to establish that, you have to have direct evidence of an agreement. If there's direct evidence, then the standard is much easier because it's per se. That means they do not have to establish other elements in order to show that there's a possibility of a conspiracy. If there is no direct evidence and it's only circumstantial, remember, then we get into the idea of them having to show parallel. Nevertheless, plaintiff alleged additional circumstantial evidence involving all defendants that, when viewed as a whole, plausibly suggest an agreement. 
These allegations are more than sufficient as the, at the pleading stage and defendant's motion to dismiss. Now, why are they talking about also the circumstantial case? Because you have to put everything into your opposition papers because you have to cover all the possibilities. You can't just assume that you're going to win on the one argument. You have to throw in the kitchen sink in, a, in legal papers. So they're saying, look, listen, we believe that we have a case that establishes a per se violation and direct evidence. But in the event that we don't have that and the court disagrees with that assertion, we also can establish that there is circumstantial case as well. The motion to dismiss uh, that attacks the complaint on three grounds. First, defendant asserts the complaint fails to set forth allegations of anti-competitive agreement. Remember, for a conspiracy, there has to be an agreement. Defendants claim that the complaint fails to set forth antitrust violations either under the per se rule or the rule of reason. Congress has already determined that plaintiff's antitrust claim should move forward by embedding into the Dodd-Frank Act an expansive savings clause applicable to plaintiff's claims. Remember, the third argument set forth by the defendant in their papers is that this is really a securities matter. But the plaintiff points out that the Dodd-Frank Act carves out an ex exception, which allows this to go forward on antitrust grounds, which is a great argument. Rather than cut their losses, Citadel acquired even larger short positions in the relevant securities after the market closed on January 27, 2021, and did so with the knowledge that prices of the relevant securities would soon fall. So here the allegation is this. They set up the agreement on January 27th before everything took place, doubled and tripled down on their short positions. And they're saying that the reason why they allege that is because they knew that the price would go down and they would be able to take a windfall and make their money back on any losses they had uh, taken uh, on the way up. Plummeting share prices and loss of investor confidence forced many retail investors, including plaintiffs, to sell their shares of the relevant securities at prices lower than they otherwise would have, but for defendants' collusive behavior. Again, here they're saying that they failed to uh, permit retail to sell their shares. Citadel Securities conspired with the brokerage defendants and the clearing defendants to prevent retail investors from purchasing shares of the relevant securities to artificially suppress share prices so that Citadel Securities could cover its short position and mitigate its losses. So here we go. They have the conspiracy set up. They set it up where they were going to limit the ability for retail to do what they need to do so Citadel could cover their shorts. Rule 8.2 requires only a short and plain statement of a claim for relief to give the defendant fair notice of the claim is grounds and upon which it rests. So again, this goes back to what I was saying in yesterday's video. When you are dealing with a motion to dismiss, the documentation set forth and allegations set forth in the complaint have to be assumed to be true and they have to be looked upon in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, which is the people that are suing Citadel and Robin Hood and the other brokerages. On their 12B6, when reviewing a motion to dismiss, a court construes the complaint in the light most favorable to the plaintiff and takes factual allegations as true, as I just said. The proof is largely in the hands of the alleged conspirators. Dismissals prior to giving the plaintiff ample opportunity to discovery should be granted very sparingly. Here's the really important part. And this is the part that is like the most vital. The During this stage of the litigation, the plaintiff in any case, not only this case, but just any case in general, the plaintiff never has all the information they need to establish their case. That's why they're just considered allegations. As a plaintiff, you are alleging something. You don't have any proof because discovery hasn't been done yet. Discovery is the process by which you ask questions and ask for documentation that is going to help prove your allegations. It's not like they just come up out of the ether and you discover this stuff. You have to actually get the documentation from the other side. That's why this surviving this motion to dismiss is key. They have, they're lucky, the plaintiffs, in that they have a little bit of information that was obtained from the discovery from another matter, from the subpoenas, from the government um, hearings. That was very fortunate. And again, remember, those were like 20,000 page, 25,000 page worth of documents where they snuck in a few tidbits here or there with the hope that they would be missed. And that's why, if you look at the pleadings, they've amended them a few times because think about it. You know, after going through these things with a fine tooth comb, you know, multiple times over and over again, you discover more and more because it's just like stuck in between thousands of pages of actual nonsense that has no relevance to the case. Um, so an agreement and restraint of trade can est be established by direct evidence 
or through circumstantial evidence. As we said before, direct would be a per se, and then circumstantial would be the secondary way of establishing your case. But then if you do that, you have to also show parallel conduct and plus factors, which makes your case a little bit more difficult, which really isn't that it's important at the pleading stage, but it's really important if that's the standard that's going to be implemented, you know, as this proceeds. Plaintiff's claim should be viewed as a whole. The character and effect of a conspiracy are not to be judged by dismembering it and viewing it in separate parts, but only looking at it as a whole. Yeah, so if you go back and you look at the defendant's motion to dismiss, you know, they basically are just taking a bar, taking bits and pieces and saying, well, this piece doesn't make sense and this piece doesn't make sense. So therefore there's no conspiracy. Well, no, that's not the way you have to look at it. You have to look at it from every single bit and piece and then look at that in totality and say, is there a conspiracy? It can't just be, oh, well, we did this because of this. Or we did that because of that. Therefore, that's it. But those are only two parts to the story. There's another 25. What about those other 25? How do those fit in? And if you throw those 25 back in with those other two and you look at it as a whole, is there a conspiracy? That's the true standard. If a complaint includes non-conclusory allegations of direct evidence of an agreement, a court need not go any further on the question of whether an agreement has adequately been pledged. Again, remember, this is just based upon the evidence that they currently have. And they do have evidence of direct conversations, right, with Citadel and Robinhood of a possible agreement. And that is, a, and it's plausible. I believe that it's plausible based upon what I've read. Uh, but again, these are allegations and, uh, you know, allegations have not been proven. But at this stage in pleading, remember, you don't have to prove them. They just have to be, they just have to basically spell out enough to establish the elements. Plaintiffs allege that the high level executive of Citadel Securities and Robin communicated with each other in the days leading up to the trading restrictions and reached an expressed agreement on January 25th, 2021. If you look at here, these little paragraphs here, they're referencing the paragraphs in their complaint. So when you read this motion into the, uh, uh, the opposition to motion to dismiss, you can go back and you can look in the complaint and you'll see what paragraphs they're referring to. That's what these uh, little citations are at the end. Shortly after Robinhood decided to move the relevant securities to restrict trading on in, an internal Robinhood communication confirmed that Robinhood was monitoring the conspiracy. Robinhood employees were discussing that others were doing the same. Further, Robinhood decided to impose purchasing restrictions on the relevant securities shortly after the NSCC margin call, indicating that Robinhood had premeditated its decision prior to the call. Now, this is pretty key, all right? You know, because now we're seeing that there is some type of real thought out plan in place by Robinhood to do this. So that's their basically these prior pa paragraphs that I just went over were their arguments in regards to how they have direct evidence showing that there was a conspiracy. Now they're getting into the circumstantial part of the case. Parallel conduct occurs when competitors act similarly or follow the same course of action. For example, adopting similar policies at or around the time in response to similar market conditions. Remember, the defendant in the motion to dismiss was saying, well, Robinhood, E-Trade, and a lot of the other brokerages, they all didn't do the same thing. So a conspiracy doesn't make sense. If, if there was a conspiracy, they would have all done the same thing. But that's not the standard. It's not that they have to be exact policies or exactly similar. It says, it says adopting similar policies at or around the time. So it doesn't matter that they all didn't do the same thing. They all did adopt some similar practice of limitation. Defendant's argument that plaintiffs do not plausibly allege parallel conduct among the defendants is nullified by the specific allegation in the complaint detailing how on January 28th, the brokerage defendants and the clearing defendants coordinated and implemented identical or near identical restrictions prohibiting retail investors from purchasing the relevant securities less than 24 hours after Citadel acquired massive short positions in the relevant security. So here you go. They're pointing out that very important fact that there was identical or near identical, but you don't need the identical part. The near identical or very similar part is what you need. The question at the pleading stage <clears throat> is not whether there is a plausible alternative to plaintiff's theory. The question is whether there are sufficient factual allegations to make the complaints, cl cl complaints claim plausible. So again, let's go back and think about what they said in the defendant's motion to dismiss. They were saying that there was an alternative. They were saying, listen, this has nothing to do with a conspiracy. This has to do with the fact that 
you know, we our backs were against the wall and we had no choice but to do this because of the of the margin call. We had no choice. Otherwise, you know, we would have been in big trouble on our end. So, you know, we couldn't do that. So they offer a plausible alternative. Okay, well, that's a defense. That's a plausible alternative. They can use that at another stage. At this point, we're talking about the pleadings. The pleadings are have to be looked upon on their own, on their own, not a, as the a, a possible defense existing. So here they're saying that they've set forth enough elements to show that they have a plausible claim, not that they, the other side, the defense, has a plausible defense. While true that certain brokerages such as Charles Schwab and TD Ameritrade place restrictions on certain transactions, neither firm restricted retail investors from purchasing the relevant security. Plus factors are parallel behavior that would probably not result from chance, coincidence, independent response to common stimuli, or mere independence unaided by an advanced understanding among the parties. The complaint is replete with specific factual allegations. Defendants' common motive to conspire, they had something that they both would get out of it, actions against unilateral self-interest, opportunity to coordinate and collude, evidence of concealment and pretext, and the existence of government investigations, the courts have identified as indicative of concerted action and coordinated, not unilateral conduct. Again, so these are factors. So it, it doesn't mean that they have to establish every single one of these factors. The courts will, again, look at everything in a totality circumstance. Where circumstances are such as to warrant a jury in finding that the conspirators had a unity of purpose, the conclusion that a conspiracy established is justified. Plaintiffs, <clears throat> this is a really great part. Plaintiffs allege that Citadel accumulated large short positions in the relevant securities. There was a significant increase in dark pool trading activity in the week beginning January 25th, 2021. The bulk of that trading activity is attributed to Citadel securities and short volume reporting is consistent with Citadel taking on a large short position immediately prior to the trading restrictions. As the price of the relevant securities increased, so did Citadel's short exposure. As a result, Citadel was subject to potentially infinite losses if it could not stop the price of the relevant securities from surging. To stop the price surge and stave off billions of dollars in losses, Citadel Securities leveraged its relationship with brokerage and clearing defendants and reached an agreement to halt retail investors from purchasing the retail securities. Prior to the implementing of this agreement, Citadel entered into new short positions in the relevant securities at peak prices with the hope of it tanking. Once the agreement was in place, Citadel was able to profit from orchestrated decrease in price Although the decision to restrict trading in relevant securities against the brokerage and clearing defendants' self-interest, each had a financial stake in the conspiracy through their lucrative payment for order flow relationship with Citadel Securities. For example, Citadel was responsible for 30% of Robinhood's revenues in 2020. And in the first quarter of 2021 alone, Citadel paid Robinhood over $141 million for proof of order flow, a con controversial practice ripe for illegal coordination. Exactly. This is what we were talking about yesterday, right? In their motion to dismiss, they were saying, Robin Hood was saying, listen, we didn't want to do this. This was the last thing we wanted to do. We were going to have egg on our face. We were going to lose a ton of money. We were going to lose a ton of customers. We, we didn't want to have to do this. Oh, no. But wait a minute. What about the fact that if they didn't do this, they could have, Citadel could have allegedly lost a ton of money, an infinite amount of money, as set forth in, in, this, in the papers. And if they did lose an infinite amount of money, how's Robinhood going to get paid by Citadel? They would lose their golden goose. And I think that's really what the, what, the, what, the, what the crux of the argument is here. And it's a really good argument. And this is a really key uh, set of paragraphs in this uh, motion, opposition. The preservation of brokerage and clearing defense is mutually beneficial and highly lucrative payment for order flow relationship alone provides sufficient motive to conspire. The complaint contains publicly available data establishing that short positions increased leading up to January 28, 2021 and dropped significantly thereafter. Again, this was back to what they were talking about yesterday. They were saying that there's no way for them to prove that there was an increase in short activity by Citadel. But there is circumstantial evidence that shows that. FINRA data shows notable and significant increases in dark pool trading activity for each of the relevant securities on or around January 2018, 2021. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Consistent with institutional investors taking advantage of trading restrictions to exit their vulnerable short positions at the expense of retail investors. FINRA OTC transparency data further indicates that the bulk of the elevation in dark trading activity for the week of January 25th, 2021 can be attributed to Citadel. 
Defendants argue that plaintiffs fail to allege any actions taken by defendants against their self-interest that are probative of a conspiracy because there is no collective self-interest. That's not true. Remember, there is definitely some type of conspiracy and self-interest at stake in these cases based upon the relationship between the parties. Simply put, if a broker were to unilaterally restrict trading, they would lose investors to other brokers who are not restricting unless the broker knew others were restricting. Because imposing such restrictions were so against defendants' individual self-interest, any act to restrict trading would be sufficient. Here, there were multiple identical acts against self-interest. The decision to restrict trading, which is not only highly suggestive, but highly corroborative of the concerted action or agreement. Again, like we said before, there is a clear, plausible conspiracy between the parties because the restrictions would definitely have aided in the possibility of the stock price going down, which would thereby help the, sh the shorts and thereby allow Citadel to maintain liquidity and therefore allow Robinhood to continue to be paid. Defendants at Apple opportunity to conspire. The financial industry is close-knit and secretive, replete with specialized jargon and terminology. Individuals within the industry frequently move from one company to another and often work closely with competitors. For example, Robinhood previously used Apex as its clearing firm and Citadel has paid thin for order flow relationship with other defendants. These pre-existing relationships allow defendants to communicate swiftly and effectively with one another to effectuate the conspiracy. Yes, this is a really important point because defendants keep saying, well, we don't talk to anybody. We don't know anybody in these other companies, which is complete nonsense. This type of community is one of those communities where people poach from one another. They hop and skip between firms. So yes, there's always someone who's saying, listen, I can get you a conversation with so-and-so and they know the buzzwords. They know the words to use in these conversations to protect themselves. So that's why we really, if you get out of this pleading stage, you get some more discovery, you see some more communications, you get some people in to really talk about those communications and what those words really mean. You know, you really open up the Pandora's box. That's why they are desperate to win this motion and to get this case dismissed. Because if discovery takes place, it's really going to blow the doors off of this thing. Defendant attempts to avoid these specific allegations by complaining that after reviewing tens of thousands of pages of discovery, plaintiffs point to only a handful of interfirm communications in their complaint. This argument is a red herring. First, the court has stayed discovery. Remember, that's important. They stayed this, the court stayed discovery. So the plaintiff was not able to get any documentation prior to this. They were only able to rely upon the documentation that was already in existence from the subpoena. The court has permitted plaintiffs to obtain a limited set of materials which defendants had previously produced in response to subpoenas and requests from government regulators in the aftermath of the events giving rise to this lawsuit. They were products of requests of others and were limited in scope. Plaintiffs have not had the benefit of full discovery, yet have still uncovered numerous inculpatory communications. That's important. Remember, Defendants kept saying, oh, well, plaintiffs had so much time and they had all these documents, but that's not true. They had a very limited number of documents. And even from a limited number of documents, they were still able to find a number of conversations. Because So could you imagine what's, what's out there? Second, as discussed in part four, many of the uncovered communications are cryptic in nature and make arrangements for further substantive discussions through telephone calls, implying that defendant effectuated the conspiracy through unrecorded means that would not appear in the documents produced. Elusive practices that, while not in themselves illegal, may still lead to an inference of the existence of a conspiracy. So here they're saying that, listen, again, we have very limited information. A lot of this was very hush-hush. So, But if we can get to that discovery phase, we believe that we can get some more information. And, and, really, and remember, part of discovery is, is conducting what's called depositions. And depositions are basically dragging these people in and asking them questions directly. The suspicious timing and the cryptic nature of certain and interim interfirm inter communications support the inference of an illegal conspiracy. For example, days before the trading restrictions were imposed, high-level executives of Robinhood and Citadel communicated and reached an express agreement. The substance of their agreement was deliberately omitted from their written communications and further discussed what held the unrecorded means. Less than 24 hours before the purchasing restrictions were imposed, an unrecorded telephone conversation transpired between high-level employees of Citadel Securities and Robinhood to presumably discuss payment for order flow, but the exact substance and nature of the discussion is unknown. Again, this is important because, remember, Citadel is saying that they didn't have any discussions like this, but they definitely had discussions. We just don't know what was said during them. 
Robinhood initially attributed the trading restrictions to market volatility, only to later assert that clearinghouse collateral requirements forced Robinhood to impose trading restrictions. However, contrary to its explanations, Robinhood was in fact able to meet its January 28th clearinghouse collateral requirement a little after nine and before the stock market opened. Yet Robinhood nonetheless decided to restrict purchase of the relevant securities throughout the entirety of the trading day and continued to place restrictions until February 4th. This is incredibly key to the case. Remember, their whole argument is that we had no choice but to do this because we were going to lose money. But in fact, they were able to meet the amount. They had the money. They were able to negotiate a deal and come up with it. But yet they are that they still held off and restricted trading until February 4th. Defendants concede that courts generally recognize that economic factors and market characteristics such as high market concentration, significant barriers to entry, and a commoditized product contribute to a circumstantial case. Indeed, securities market is by its very nature conducive to collusion and anti-competitive conduct. This is really important if you think about it, and it's true. I mean, it's something that's talked about every day on Twitter and on the news that basically the markets are in and of themselves inherently collusive and open to anti-competitive conduct because there's a very limited amount of restrictions that are placed on them. And even if the restrictions do exist, they're not enforced. Perhaps the most telling market factor rendering the securities market susceptible to collusion is the opaqueness of investor short positions. Investment managers who control over 100 million in assets are required by the SEC to report their long positions, put options and call options quarterly via Form 13s, but they are not required to disclose their short positions. Moreover, these reports have a reputation of being riddled with errors, making any information gleaned extremely unreliable. Although FINRA requires its member firms to report their short positions in all equity securities twice a month, FINRA reporting is likewise flawed in that short interest reports are not published concurrently with member disclosures and do not capture short intervals of time wherein the short positions could have changed dramatically. That's important. Think about it, guys. Again, this goes back to everything that everyone's been saying for months and even and a year, over a year now. Everything is so secretive and everything is withheld from the public view. None of us are able to know what's going on. It's a completely unfair advantage. Plaintiffs allege that internal communications among Robinhood's upper echelons of management reflect that in response to the decision to restrict trading to retail investors on January 28, 2021, Robinhood received direct information that all firms are doing the same thing. Plaintiffs allege numerous contact between defendants in the days before the trading restrictions were imposed on January 28th include many communications on January 27, 2021. Again, this is Robinhood being told that all the firms are going to be doing all the same thing, that they were all in, a, in on it. It is premature for the court to determine whether the per se rule of reason test applies at the motion to dismiss stage. Even if the court chooses to make such a determination, plaintiffs have sufficiently alleged facts given rise to application of the per se rule. Remember, we were going back and talking about this before, that there's two different types of uh, proof per se, and then there's also the collateral. The agreement among defendants to impose restraints on the market was not formed as a legitimate business collaboration, but rather was formed with the objective intent to restrict retail investors' access to the stock market and prevent the market from operating freely, thereby decreasing the quality of market output. Defendants' con conduct was therefore a naked restraint on trade properly evaluated under the per se framework. Again, they're saying that there's a clear-cut case for the, a violation of the Sherman Act. There is a conspiracy to restrict trade, free trade. While these entities may not have played the same role in the process of executing a transaction upon behalf of the retail investors, such a dynamic is not evidence of vertical relationship and therefore does not preclude per se treatment. The facts alleged do not describe a vertical relationship where defendants were at different levels of distribution. Plaintiff's allegations, plaintiff's allegations evidence an unlawful horizontal agreement by defendants engaging in anti-competitive conduct by restricting markets and limiting transactions which could be placed in a free and fair market. Remember yesterday, we talked about how the defendants were saying <clears throat> that this is not, uh, the, the, re the relationship is in this case is vertical and not horizontal, and you need a horizontal agreement in order for there to be a per se. Defendants attempt to avoid per se treatment by contending that they participate in different markets. Remember, they're saying, well, we have the brokers, we have the market makers, we have the clearinghouses. They're saying that they're all part of different markets rather than being all part of one giant group of markets. So this is my favorite part in the motion on the opposition. And I posted this yesterday 
Uh, I'm just going to read it because I just love it. It's my favorite part. Defendant's rhetorical flourish that the trading activity and price movements were unprecedented is not true as professional traders and head fudge have engaged in short squeeze plays for decades. The only unique facet here is that retail customers were able to use the brokerage defendant's platform to profit in the same way as professional traders. While defendants are correct in their assertion that what occurred was unprecedented, they missed the mark on correctly identifying it. What was unprecedented was the decision by brokerage defendants to impose restrictions upon retail investors that restricted only purchasing of the relevant securities and not selling of the same, while permitting institutional investors, such as their co-conspirators, to continue trading unfettered. This is the key of the case. This is it. Listen, they are trying to say, oh, this has never happened before. Complete nonsense. This is not the first short squeeze, nor will it be the last short squeeze to ever happen. They happen every day. This is a clear case of trying to pull the wool over our eyes and treat us like dumb money, which is not true. We know exactly what's going on. It's being done right in front of our faces and we're calling them out on it. Well, I should say the lawyers in this case are calling them out on it. A traditional, this part's great too. This is another, This I think this is really the type of conspiracy that we're dealing with here. And I think this argument is their strongest argument in terms of the per se treatment um, that they're calling this the traditional hub and spoke conspiracy. A traditional hub and spoke conspiracy consists of a hub, spoke, firms that deal with the same product and then enter into vertical agreements with the hub and an agreement between the firms. This is really the key, I think, to the arguments in this case that's going to help them survive the motion to dismiss. Citadel served as the hub that facilitated the trading restrictions with the brokerage defendants who agreed to implement them. Citadel stood to benefit from these restrictions as the restrictions helped Citadel avoid substantial losses resulting from their distressed short positions in the relevant securities. In furtherance of the conspiracy, Citadel also served as the intermediary for communications between brokerage defendants, the spokes. The elimination of competition was organized and facilitated by this hub and spoke arrangement, which successfully altered the market by artificially depressing the volume of relevant securities purchases and depressing relevant prices. These allegations are more than sufficient to establish an agreement among the spokes of the conspiracy. In sum, plaintiffs allege that the hub and spoke conspiracy consisted of one, Citadel serving as the hub, two, brokerage defendants, Apex and other clearing defendants serving as spokes, implementing the vertical trade restrictions directed at Citadel, and three, a resulting horizontal agreement between clearing and brokerage firms to implement, coordinate, and maintain the restrictions. Taken as a whole, these allegations plead a per se conspiracy. Again, guys, this is really the strongest part of the opposition to the motion to dismiss. And if the judge is going to rule in favor of the plaintiffs and deny the defendant's motion to dismiss, I think this is really going to be the strongest part of the case and the strongest argument that is set forth. <clears throat> because the parameters of a given market are questions of fact, plaintiffs must only present enough information in their complaint to plausibly suggest the contours of the relevant geographical markets. Defendants puzzlingly argue that plaintiff's claims have nothing to do with competition at all. Their argument is plainly incorrect. Restrictions on price and output are the paradigmic principle examples of restraint of trade that the Sherman Act was intended to prohibit. Again, they're, again, this is all smoke and mirrors by the defendant. They're claiming all of these outlandish things that this doesn't apply to this or this doesn't apply to that. But in reality, the law is on the side of the plaintiff. Again, and now we'll go back to the, their last argument, which was that this is more of a securities issue, and therefore, because it's a securities issue, there shouldn't be an antitrust claim. But as you'll see here, the Dodd-Frank Act protects that. In passing the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress amended the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 and added provisions regarding short sales, the types of transactions giving rise to plaintiffs' antitrust claims. Further, Congress added an expansive antitrust savings clause, making clear that antitrust claims with respect to matters addressed in the legislation were not precluded. Nothing in this act or any amendment made by this act shall be construed to modify, impair, or supersede the operation of any of the antitrust laws unless otherwise specified. So again, the whole argument that this is a securities case and it should be dealt with by the SEC is protected under the Dodd-Frank Act. Again, they go into more about the whole SAC aspect of it. Again, I think that's really not their strongest argument uh, on the defense side. So I didn't go over that in the video. I'm not gonna go over it uh, any further in detail here. Um, and that's basically the opposition to the 
motion to dismiss. Really, really interesting stuff in that motion to dismiss. Now, remember, we're waiting now for the defendant to submit a reply to the opposition, uh, which is due in a couple of days. Once that goes up and the reply is on, up on the database, I will be posting a video while I'm going over the reply. And uh, hopefully we'll have that up in a few days. Guys, listen, if you like the videos, grab your gavel and smash that like button down below for me. If you have any questions, leave questions in the comments. If you wanna see any other material uh, related to this case, or, or if you want something uh, discussed that's not always related directly to this particular case, but other cases, let me know and I'll be happy to do, do it. Um, until then, uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your Sunday. If you are watching football today, uh, I hope your teams win and I hope you do well in your fantasy leagues. And until then, the lawyer of the apes is adjourned.